Genesis chapter 10 is the broader view of the events surrounding the Tower of Babel found in Genesis chapter 11. The Tower of Babel was the event, and then the scattering of the nations of the earth with their various languages was the result. In Genesis chapter 10, we get the overview of the scattering of the nations. Just as the nation of Israel finds its roots in the one man whose name is Abraham, or Abram when he was first called by God. And just like Abraham is listed by name first before his descendants became a nation, our chapter this evening is another genealogy or another list of names of the men from where these nations had originated from. So all the nations of the world, at least a good number of them, are found in this chapter in chapter 10, beginning with just one man. But this is actually three different genealogies. This is a list of the different men who were born to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, the three families that were coming out of the ark at the end of chapter 9. This small family of Noah's sons and their wives were told to be fruitful and to replenish the earth, and they did. So just as all of us are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, our original parents, so then after the flood, all of us, every tongue, tribe, nation, and language descended from one of the three sons of the surviving family who had come off the ark, the sons of Noah. In Genesis chapter 10, in verse 1, it reads, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were born sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togamoth, the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Now right away, starting with, with even verse 1, is the list of names. And this is different than the names of the men that we looked at in Genesis chapter 5. In chapter 5, the genealogy went from Adam down to Noah, or up to Noah, or however you want to say it. But that was a, a list of mankind in general. And since there wasn't a divide between the nations before the flood, they were all just of the same race, and that's the human race, the genealogy in chapter 5 was specifically the list of men who were believers in the earth from believing Adam to believing Noah, and then all of the believing men in between who believed in the promise of God concerning the seed of the woman or the Savior of the world. Now, in the days after the flood, in our chapter this evening, in chapter 10, we have the dividing of the families of the earth, or the dividing of the nations. Like I had said, these families were separated or scattered across the whole earth as a result of their rebellion at the Tower of Babel. And we'll read about that event next week. But the separation of the nations went with the descendants from the three sons of Noah. Each man's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, each of their sons and grandsons went in their different directions as they scattered abroad throughout the whole earth. So let's just look at the first man or the first son of Noah in verses 1 through 5, and that was Japheth the youngest son of Noah. Japheth, his name means opened, which I find interesting if you notice what it reads in Acts 14:27, um, And this is in Antioch right after Paul's first missionary journey. 
It reads, And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Japheth's name means opened. And Japheth is the father of many of the Western Gentiles or of the Europeans. It mentions in verse 2 that Japheth had seven sons, and then in verses 3 and 4 it mentions that he had seven grandsons. This list of the sons and grandsons of not just Japheth, but all three sons of Noah are what's called an ethnology. That's sort of like a family tree. But you could call this whole chapter the table of nations. The table of nations. Because this isn't just the line of the godly sons of Noah leading up to Christ himself. That's one particular family tree. And this is not just a line of the same family within the same race, but these are all the different nations of the whole earth. The Jewish line, the Gentile line, and then the line that's in strong opposition to God's people, namely the sons of Canaan. Going through the list of the seven sons of Japheth, let's take a look at the nations that these men were the fathers of. And so you can follow along with me, and then I got a map for you guys. Did you get a map, John? And so you can follow along with me and see where these men went. Now, look on your map real quick, and do you guys know where the ark the, the ark of Noah rested, if you look on this map? Turkey. Very good. So Turkey to the far east, which is your right, where it says Armenia, pretty much right there. That's where Mount Ararat was. So remember, that's where civilization started. And then I think they went down southward towards that, and they started settling. That's where the Tower of Babel was in Babylon, which is in modern-day Iraq. So first there's Gomer. The descendants of Gomer often identified with the, with the Sumerians who first settled on the shores of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and who later went from there to Europe as far as the Atlantic Ocean. There's traces of the Sumerian race in Germany and in Wales. It's funny that in secular history, it's stated that the origin of the Sumerians is unclear. But the earliest traces of their existence can be traced back to the region of modern-day Turkey, somewhere around Mount Ararat. And that's exactly what it says in secular history. They're not sure where they came from, how they originated, but it was from somewhere around modern-day Turkey. Another son of Japheth was Magog. The descendants of Magog are the Scythians. I don't know if you call them the Scythians, because <laughs> there's a C in there. S-C-Y, anyway. Uh, they first inhabited the area known as the Caucasus, which is the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea near to Mount Ararat again. But moving northward, Magog's descendants would be the Russians. And if you've heard the term Gog and Magog, Gog is simply a reference to the fierce ruler of that region, much like the Pharaoh or the Caesar. Gog and Magog are the king and his kingdom. And then there's Madai. His descendants are believed to be the Medes who were first settled right below the Caspian Sea, but then moved slightly eastward and toward the south just a bit. Javan is the next son of Japheth. He's believed to be the father of the Greek people. And then there's Tubal and Meshach, moving northward to Armenia. These also are believed to be the fathers of the Russians. And lastly, of Japheth's sons is Tyrus. Tyrus is thought to be the father of the Thracians who dwelled in Taurus, which is modern-day Bulgaria, just north of Greece. It took a while to practice pronouncing all these names. 
The sons of Japheth moved mostly north and northwest. That would be from the direction of Mount Ararat or the area near to the Tower of Babel. The Europeans are most of the white races that descended from Japheth. The Medes would be considered the furthest eastern nation from Japheth. And the Medes are Iranians. Many American Iranians today like to call themselves Persians because of the stigma in the West against Iran. When it comes to the grandsons of Japheth, these are the families that began with these nations that we had just mentioned. These grandsons were identified with the same nations as the sons. Now, many Jewish commentators believe that the nation of Germany are descendants of the one grandson, Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz is mentioned in verse 3. Some say that the Hebrew term for Germany is the word Nazi. But I also read that the term Nazi is an abbreviation that comes from the title National Socialist. So it's Nazi. It's just a shortened form of National Socialist. So there's a couple of different opinions about that name. But one thing we do know is that if you're of German descent, then you're a descendant of Noah's son, Japheth. It's interesting that many of the Jews living in Europe and Germany still to this day adopted the name of Japheth's grandson and are called Ashkenazic Jews. And why they would adopt that name is beyond me, really. Perhaps it's an identification with one of the sons of Noah while they were spread throughout Europe. I, I don't know. But the next son of Noah is mentioned in chapter 5. It's Ham and his descendants. Ham is the son that looked upon his father's nakedness in some sort of sin, and he brought upon his descendants, the sons of Canaan, a curse. In verse 6 it reads, And the sons of Ham... Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ra'ama, and Sabteca, and the sons of Ra'ama, Sheba, and Dedan. Ham is the middle son of Noah. His name means hot, and not that he's hot mad, but it's more of a temperature hot. Here you have in this portion the four sons of Ham, five grandsons through Cush, and three great-grandsons through Cush's son, Ra'ama. The four sons of Ham are as follows. Cush is the first son mentioned. In Jeremiah 13.32, it mentions the descendants of Cush as being Ethiopians. Also in Isaiah 45.14, it also mentions that these men of Ethiopia were men of great stature. That means that they were very tall. The Cushites are believed to have traveled south from Babel and settled somewhere along the Nile River in what is modern-day Ethiopia. It's also believed that the Cushites went southeast to Arabia, somewhere along the Persian Gulf, and settled there as well. The next son of Ham is Mizraim. He's believed to have founded Egypt, and the original name of Egypt was Kem, spelled K-E-M. And some believe that that's a reference to the name Ham. So Kem would be Ham. The next son, Foot. Foot is believed to have founded the nation of Libya along the African coast just west of Egypt on the south end of the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see the Mediterranean Sea right here on your map. Here's Egypt. That's, here's Ethiopia. That's where Cush had found it. And then there's Libya. Now Canaan was the son of Ham that was cursed of Noah. And I'd say Canaan was cursed of God, really. The descendants of Canaan occupied the nation that bore his name, which is the land of Canaan. 
The various tribes in that land and some surrounding tribes were always in conflict with the children of God or those in the line of Shem or to be even more specific, the sons of Abraham. These tribes or these families or the sons of Canaan are mentioned down in verses 15 through 19. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But there's one thing that I wanted to mention right here is that all the various nations of the earth are mentioned in the book of Revelation, in John's vision of heaven. It reads in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It mentions that they're redeemed saints in heaven from all over the earth, true believers in Jesus Christ from every nation. But if you look on a current map, of the religions of the world, you'll notice that the territories of Japheth hold the most professing Christians. And like I said, if you take it from Iraq and go north, you have to include Iran, you go north to Russia, to Europe, and then all Canada, and then uh, quite a bit of the United States, then all those nations really are the Gentile believers in the world. And that's where most of the professing Christians are in the world of the descendants of Japheth. That would be the Western Gentile nations. There's believers in the Eastern Gentile nations, which would be the descendants of Ham, but not too many comparatively. And in the Middle East of the descendants of Shem, it's close to none in the Arab nations, and also in Israel. God always has his remnant of believers from every nation, but I find it interesting that the line of Shem holds the least members of the church of Jesus Christ in the world today. Now in verse 8, we're going to take a closer look at one of the sons of Cush. He's a grandson of Ham. And Cush begat... Nimrod, or Cush was the father of Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar, which is ancient Babylon and modern-day Iraq. It's believed that Nimrod was the first imperialist. And that means that he desired to rule over other men. It mentions in verse 10 that he had a kingdom with cities in his kingdom. Imperialism is based on domination and subordination. Nazi Germany is an example of an imperialist empire and that's defined as one that desired world dominance, unequivocal exploitation, extermination or reductions of undesired peoples, and settlement of desired peoples into those territories. In other words, Germany at one time wanted to take over the whole world and make every nation a province of Germany. The Roman Empire was an imperialist nation or an imperialist empire as well. Where it reads that Nimrod was a mighty man in the earth and a mighty hunter before the Lord, this means that Nimrod was believed to be one of the giants in the earth after the flood. And if he were around the size of Goliath or Og, the king of Bashan, then he could have been anywhere from nine foot tall to about 12 feet tall. And these giants back then, they weren't lanky and awkward 
like some of the taller men of today. Nimrod was a fierce warrior. As a mighty hunter, he's believed to have hunted men and sought out the ones that would have posed any threat to his rule. And he would have killed the strongest of them and made the others to serve in his empire. Much like Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, did after him. But the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Nimrod is that Nebuchadnezzar used armies to conquer. And Nimrod, he used his own mighty strength. The name Nimrod comes from the word Marad, which means to rebel. Can you imagine naming your son Rebel? Pretty much. And that's why he's said to be a mighty hunter before God. And that word before in the before God could also be the word against. He was against God. He had broken away from the godly line of men in the earth and he was going to form his own government in the world and his own religion. With himself as the imperialist ruler and his wife as the false religious practitioner. There's a pretty fantastic story about Nimrod and his wife. And even though it doesn't mention his wife in the Bible, it's believed by secular history that Nimrod was married to Semiramis. Semiramis was the woman who was responsible for introducing idolatry into the world and making Babylon the place of eternal mysteries, the place of rebellion to God by the satanic imitation of God. Semiramis was the queen of Babylon, the mother of idolatry. Semiramis is said to have given birth to an illegitimate son. And after a successful plot to kill her husband Nimrod, she claimed that her son Tammuz was a god himself. And this picture of mother with child is an imitation of God's promise to provide a savior born of a virgin or born of the seed of the woman. It was an imitation. And that is the mother of all harlots, the abomination of the world. Statues of the mother with child are idols within the Catholic Church still to this day. And to make a long story short, it's been said that all goddess worship and idolatry or the worship of false gods can be traced back to Semiramis. In verse 11, it reads, Out of that land, that's out of the land of Shinar, went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kala and resin between Nineveh and Kala. The same is a great city, and Mizraim begot Ludim and Anamim and Lahabim and Naphtuhim, <laughs> Na Naphtuhim, and Pathusim and Kasluhim, out of who came Philistim and Kaphorim. And you could see why. <laughs> Why we shorten names up. I mean, why can't they be called Mark and Jeff and Bob? These names are very difficult to pronounce. Now, Asher was believed to be the land of ancient Assyria. And you can see that on your map. Honestly, it's not really there, but it is uh, at the top of Iraq and Syria and the top of Iran on that end. That's where Assyria was. It probably wasn't a, a man named Asher who built the city, like it appears to read in the King James Version of the Bible, but it was probably Nimrod who went forth out of Shinar, and that's the land around Babylon, and conquered that area and built another city. He built the city of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of ancient Assyria that was most famous for the prophet of God that was sent there to Nineveh to cry against it for their wickedness. And that was the prophet Jonah. The city of Nineveh today is in ruins. 
It sits on the side of the Tigris River, just across from the modern-day major city of Mosul in Iraq, believed to be one of the oldest cities in the world. Rezin was another city mentioned that was probably built by Nimrod also, and he was a very aggressive warrior at this time, Nimrod was. He seemed to be the one who's gaining the most territory instead of Shem and Japheth. It doesn't seem like the descendants of Ham were really under the feet of the descendants of Shem and Japheth, like Noah said they would be. Remember back in Genesis 9, 25 through 27, it reads, And Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. But it doesn't look like this at this time. I'm sure that Nimrod was aware of this curse, and I'm sure that he was defiant towards this curse, and even more aggressive because of the curse, and that's why he sought to gain so much territory. The reality of Noah's statement was not just for the immediate future, but after a long period of time, Canaan would be Shem and Japheth's servant. Or actually, they would pretty much exterminate the descendants of Canaan. I think that this should encourage us also that God's promises are all yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And he shall fulfill every single one of them that he's made to us. So if you don't see it yet, whatever promise you're holding on to, just wait and see. He'll be faithful to do everything that he said he would. Of the families that would come from Mizraim in verses 13 and 14, Mizraim was the second son of Ham. I believe that the name that stands out the most is Philistim, which would become the people's of the Philistines. And the Philistines were probably the greatest enemy to Israel in the land of promise. The Philistines weren't Middle Eastern. They weren't of Arab tribes who were born of Shem. But the Philistines were from Egypt in the south. They were descendants of Ham. In the next few verses, uh, verses 16 through 18, we see some of the families of Canaan that had occupied the territory that bore his name, that strip of land on the east end of the Mediterranean Sea, the land of Canaan. In verse 15, it reads, And Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom, and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. In verse 19, it marks out the borders of the land of Canaan. Sidon was in the western port city along the coast of the north. Gaza was along the coast in the south. Sodom and Gomorrah were the cities that were south inland near the Dead Sea. And Adma, Zeboim, and Lasha were northeast cities. And these families and even these nations, all of them were enemies to the Israelites. If you look at a world map, you'll notice that the descendants of Japheth, like I said before, moved mostly north and northwest of Babel towards Europe. And the descendants of Ham went mostly south into Africa and southeast towards China. And the descendants of Shem, they stayed in Chaldea 
which is it was called Chaldea at this time, near Babel, until Abraham was called by God to come out of there and become a nation. But then they would occupy the, the land of Israel and then just east, at least the descendants of Shem would. But still, all right in that same area there, close to Israel, but sandwiched in between the descendants of Japheth in the north and Ham in the south. And like I said before, if you look on the world map of the different religions, you can see the geographical influence today. At this time in history, you can see that Christianity has its greatest influence in the territory of Japheth and then some in Ham, but hardly any Christian influence in the descendants of Shem, which is Israel and the near Middle Eastern countries. In verses 21 through 32, we're now going to look at the descendants of Shem, also known as the Semitic tribes. That's where that term comes from. Semitic is from Shem. Or the Semitic table within this table of nations. In verse 21, it reads, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. The children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash. I think he started the monster Mash. And Arphaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begot Almodad, and Shelaf, and Hazar, Maveth, and Jera, and Hororam, and Uzo, and Dikla, and Obo, and, <laughs> and Abimael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east, which is the land of Shinar, in that same area. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So Shem was the eldest son of Noah. In verse 21, there should be a comma after the brother of Japheth. It should read, brother of Japheth, then comma, then Shem the elder. Shem was the firstborn. Both Shem and Japheth were of more noble character than their brother Ham. And when their father's nakedness was exposed, it was Shem and Japheth that walked into his tent backwards with a garment to cover their father's shame. The name Shem means name, and it would be like having the name nombre in Spanish. So you say, what's que tu nombre? Is that how the conversation would go? Nombre? Que tu nombre? No, nombre? <laughs> so I could just imagine it going back and forth. I get close enough. So speaking of Spanish, I'm sure that many of you have asked the question in, question in your minds already, where did the Mexicans come from? Did you guys think about that already? Which son of Noah did the Spanish descend from? And this is interesting because the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Mayans, and the Aztecs were all descendants of Ham. And while the Spanish... Those in Spain, or back then it was called Tarshish, were descendants of Noah's son, Japheth. So there could be a mix. A lot of people are mixed in the United States. But it's more than likely that the Latin nations of South America moved north to eventually birth the Mexicans and the American Indians. So the answer would be that the original Americas, North America, and South America were descendants of Ham. And so no matter what the original line was from, 
or who we descended from, we're all one in Christ Jesus, right? So this brings up another legitimate question, though. If we're descendants of Ham, does that mean that we're a cursed people? And the answer is no. There's no automatic generational curse. The whole world is cursed because of sin. But then again, the whole world is blessed because of Jesus. He died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And it wasn't all of the sons of Ham that were cursed either. It was just the sons of Canaan. And those families or those tribes of Canaan, and they've pretty much been wiped out already, not only by the Hebrews, but by the surrounding nations as well. Remember, theirs was the land of Canaan which doesn't exist anymore. They've been put under the feet of Shem. So the Shemites have taken over their land, just like Noah said in the curse. So consider yourselves blessed because of Jesus and not cursed because of Ham. We shouldn't really go back there. Geographically, Shem seems to have occupied the least portion uh, in the earth, you know, if you look at the geography, he gets the least amount of land between the three sons, but he also has the most descendants listed here. Five sons, six grandsons, two great-grandsons, two great-great-grandsons, and 13 great-great-great-grandsons. And this reminds me of the song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you, so let's all praise the Lord. <laughs> right arm, left arm, you know, you get the deal. So we won't look at all the sons here, but Asher, one of the five sons of Shem, is believed to have gone westward of Babel to form the nation of Assyria, where Nimrod had founded the city of Nineveh. Our Foxad is the man who's in the godly line of the faithful believers unto Abraham, and eventually unto Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the flesh. Actually, there's a few men mentioned in what's called the royal line, and that royal line is all the way down to the king, the king of kings, right? From Adam, or from Noah, and then, as in our chapter, to Shem, and then to Abraham as we get into the next couple chapters, and then eventually down to Christ. And all the men in the royal line in chapter 10 that are mentioned would be Noah, Shem, Arphaxad, Salah, Eber, and Peleg. Peleg's name means division, which would be very fitting since God had divided him and his descendants from the rest of the world. And geographically, he stayed around the area of Babel after the tower had fallen until his great-great-grandson Terah took his son Abram and began to journey towards the land of Canaan. We'll get to that in a few chapters. Terah and Abram were of Ur of the Chaldees, which is where he went from to go towards the land of Canaan. Eber, the son of Salah, is believed to be the man from where the name Hebrews came from. The name Eber means immigrants. And the name Hebrew is defined as one from beyond, an immigrant. An immigrant is a person who leaves their own country to settle permanently in another country. My wife Anna and her family are immigrants who came up from El Salvador and they settled here in the U.S. permanently to flee the civil war that was taking place in El Salvador in the late 70s and the early 80s. She was two years old when her family fled out of El Salvador. The United States is full of immigrants who came here from other countries. At the church where I was working in Costa Mesa, there was a girl that worked there that was from China, and then a young man that worked there for a while who was from 
Brazil, and he went back to Brazil. And then there was another girl who was born in Sweden, and she was working there. And there was a family from New Zealand, and I think they're still working there. And many missionaries that are leaving from California and leaving from the United States to go to the hundreds of other countries around the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to plant churches throughout the world. So another person to look at in this list of the Shemites is Lud, the father of the Lydians, and what is now modern-day Turkey. So you don't see Lydia on the map, but it's modern-day Turkey. And Aram settled in Damascus, which was Mesopotamia, and that's now modern-day Syria, and Syria is on the map also. In verse 23, it reads that one of Aram's sons was named Uz. <laughs> these names. I like John. I like the New Testament names. You know, John, Mark, Matthew, Daniel, David. Those are all great names. Uz. I don't know about that. I don't think that's too high on the list of what you're going to name your son these days. But anyway, he's believed to have settled in the Arabian desert just south of Canaan. And this is not the merry old land of Uz, but this was the area or the city where Job was from. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, it reads that there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and shunned evil. And the book of Job is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible, written sometime before Moses penned his first five books. If the Tower of Babel were sometime around 2347 BC, then the life of Job may have been somewhere around 1520 BC, which is about 800 years later. And then the law was given to Moses a short time later in 1491 BC, which is less than 50 years after the life of Job. And those are the dates that I get from the Schofield Study Bible, just in case you were wondering. When I had started this lesson on the different nations and the races, I looked up this question online. And my question was, what is the oldest race in the world? What's the earliest race in the world? And some of the things that people believe are pretty comical, really. Evolutionists say that it was Cro-Magnum man who was the earliest man in general. And I guess before the races existed, they, they would say it was Cro-Magnum man. But if they were to really take it back further, they would say that the single cell is probably a better answer <laughs> for the evolutionist, at least, right? Or that nothing in nowhere collided with more nothing and that nothing became something with a bang. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop. Some people believe that it's the Chinese from around the area of East Asia since the oldest pottery that was discovered was in a cave there in East Asia. And it's believed to be 29,000 years old from an ancient race of the Chinese. Some people believe that Africa is the originator of mankind and that the Africans are the oldest race of people in the earth. And one guy said that since we all came from Mars, then the first race must have been little green men, and we all evolved from there. But we know the truth. We know that the first man on the face of the earth and his wife were Adam and Eve. They were of the human race. And the nations weren't divided until the Tower of Babel. And the descendants of the three sons of Noah, they make up the complete table of nations. From verse 25, we can see how many generations there were from the time that Noah's three sons came off of the ark unto the Tower of Babel, where the men were divided into these various nations. And it was actually a pretty short period of time, just a few generations 
from the end of the flood to the dividing of the nations. In verse 25, it says that in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. And I think that means by nation rather than a divide in the waters or a divide in the land or anything like that. Uh, the great flood has already um, been done, is, is over and done. And the flood only divided Noah and his family from the rest of the world that perished anyways. Peleg, Peleg's brother Joktam, is believed to be the father of the Arabians or the Arab nations. And those nations that are sandwiched between the descendants of Japheth and the descendants of Ham, that's the descendants of Shem, the Arabians that are right there in the Middle East, which is still modern-day Iraq and parts of Iran, Syria, Jordan, and that area right in there. In verse 32, it reads, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. And that word divided could also mean disrupted. God had disrupted their endeavor to build a tower in Babel for their own pride. And he scattered them by nations around the whole world. Last week I had asked the question, what was the purpose of the flood? And I think one thing that was mentioned was that it was a judgment on sin. But I think you could also ask the question with that, and that is, what was the purpose then of saving Noah? And I like the answer to this question more than a worldwide judgment. God spared Noah in his grace because God had promised that he would send a Savior into the world. And that Savior hadn't come yet. So God is patiently giving the world some more time. And so as God patiently shows his grace, what do men do? And we're going to get more into this next week. Is they conglomerate and they try to build a tower for their own name. And so God divides the nations and he confuses their languages so they can't join themselves together for a time to come against him. Because when men all have the same mind, they come together and fight against the Lord. But when he divided the nations, guess what happened? They all split up and they divided themselves against each other. In the end, towards the last days, the world is going to come together as one again, united, but it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be in rebellion to the Lord. And we're going to talk more about that next week. So God is giving the world some time for the Savior to come in the flesh. And then also some time for men to believe in the Son of God or the promised Savior. One day, it's going to be all over and God will judge the world in righteousness again. But for now, we have that opportunity to put our faith in Jesus, to trust in the Savior of the world in this age of grace. We need to trust him now before it's too late.